Welcome, everybody. Um, we're very excited about today's topic. We're going to be talking about intimacy and closeness. We thought it was a fitting topic for the month of February with Valentine's Day. Um, my name is Susan Edgeman Levitan, and I'm the director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General. And I will be your moderator for today's session. Um, I want to welcome our presenters, um, Dr. Sharon Levine, who is the section head for geriatric medicine at Mass General, Jade Connor, who is an internal medicine resident, um, who has actually done a lot of work and research on this topic. And so we're really looking forward to hearing her presentation. And Dr. Matt Russell, who is the head of ambulatory care for geriatric medicine and who is also going to just be giving us some updates about what's happening in geriatrics and what's happening with our ever-present COVID um, update. So with that, I want to just share some of the housekeeping rules and tips. So um, before we get started, we've muted all of our participants today to eliminate any background noise. If you want to view the speaker on your full screen, you can go to the gallery view in the upper right corner, um, and you can either click on speaker view or gallery view, which lets you see everyone who's participating in the town hall today. If your picture becomes jumpy or out of sync, you can click stop video in the lower left corner, and that will often speed up your internet connection and will fix that problem. Um, I'm, I suspect that people are going to have a lot of questions and comments today. Please use the chat feature in the bottom ribbon. It's right in the middle. And I also just want to remind people, as we do every town hall, that everyone that is on the town hall today can see everything you write in the chat. So please do not share any personal medical information or ask personal medical questions because it can be seen by everyone. But if you do have a, a medical question, we really encourage you to reach out to your doctor directly. We'll do our best to answer all your questions. And if we don't have enough time, we'll try to get you information after the town hall today. So I've already mentioned who our speakers are and Dr. Levine will start us off and then she will hand it over to Dr. Connor and then we'll hear from um, Dr. Russell. So let's get going. Um, Susan, I just have a question. Are you going to introduce Jade? I think you have her her bio. You have oh, that? I actually do not have her bio. Uh, but if you if if you do, please jump in. Well, if um, Monique, I do you have been that? traveling. Okay, with Monique, I'll I'll try and um, I'll, I'll do it after <laughs> after I talk. Sorry, everybody. Who, I'm I, sorry I to apologize. Jade, who I will. Uh, let me just, um, Monique, if you can send that to me, I'll try and um, pull it up after I, after I, um, sp after I've spoken. Okay. Well, hi everybody. Welcome. It's another um, town senior ger geriatric medicine town hall, and it's great to see everybody on this very beautiful sugar coated day outside. Um, I love this kind of a snow. Um, so I. When Jade Connor, who is one of our interns, who's very interested in geriatric medicine and is a primary care uh, internal medicine resident here, and I met, she was very interested in hearing about our town halls and said, gee, can I give one of your town halls? And I thought, great, that's fantastic. What do you want to talk about? And she said, I, I want to talk about sex and intimacy. And I thought, that is such a fabulous topic because, first of all, I love it. I love talking to patients about it men and women, gay and straight, it doesn't matter, talking about, you know, sex and um, how it feels and what's going on is just something that comes up. And I love, I love to talk about it and, and help when people have questions about medications and worries that they have. Um, but I also love it because my mother was one of these very loose, loosey goosey people. And she was admitted to the hospital when she was 85 with a heart attack. And the house staff team was rounding on her. And, uh, and my mother started flirting with one of the interns. And, and I was going, oh, my God. Oh, God. And she said, what do you think? I don't have feelings. 
just because I'm 85, I don't have feelings. And um, I, I wanted to say, well, she's right. And so just like in the movie, has, I, I assume many people here have seen when Harry met Sally and there's the wonderful, wonderful scene where Sally says to, to um, Harry, you know, women fake orgasm all the time. He goes, no, no, you can't fake that. And she proceeds to reenact an entire organ orgasm in Katz's Delicatessen in New York. And there's an older woman who's looking on from an adjacent table. And she finally comes down after faking this orgasm. And um, the, the waitress turns to this older woman who's probably in her mid seventies and says to her, uh, may I take your order? And she looks over at Meg Ryan. She goes, I'll have what she's having because it's a wonderful and it's I love it because it's a wonderful it's a just a delightful and the woman actually turned it was that was Rob Reiner's mother Estelle who acted out that part and it was a line given by by Billy Crystal but it just shows that older people do have these feelings and do think about these things and so um it's a it's a we all have worries about it. We have worries about our health. We have worries about our partner's health. We have worries once we lose a partner or have a partner who has a memory impairment and is separated from us and what to do and how to act. Um, your generation, the people that are on this talk, you know, contraception was made available in 1965, was legalized by the constitution. And so people could uncouple sex from pregnancy. And that was a true liberation for, um, for couples and people in general. And so it was, it's been a very interesting arc over our lifetimes. So um, with that, let me just um, see if I can pull up the, my introduction to, um, to, let me see if I can get what Monique said to me, uh, Jade's bio. Hang on one sec. Okay, so. Jade Connor is originally from Dallas, Texas and moved to Boston for medical school. Prior to attending Harvard Medical School, she received her MSc in European Public Health from Maastricht University in the Netherlands, where she worked on community initiatives for caregivers of people with dementia at the Alzheimer's Center in Limburg. She is currently a first year resident in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's interested in a career in primary care and geriatrics and she hopes to care for older adults with marginalized identities. Beyond her clinical practice, she plans to work in developing and leading community-based interventions to support healthy aging in communities of color. And we're just so lucky um, to have her. Um, and I'm so delighted to be able to have her give her wonderful talk. So take it away, Jade. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so good to see all of your faces um, and to be here with you. Um, I'm just going to pull up my slides, so bear with me for one second. All right, perfect. Um, if I could just get a thumbs up that everyone can see. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah. Uh, like Dr. Levine said, I'm going to talk about uh, closeness and intimacy as we age. Um, and a big portion of this talk is talking about sex. Um, and so I want to just ground our conversation with two definitions of uh, distinct but complementary concepts. Um, so the first is sexuality. Um, and sexuality is the way we experience and express ourselves sexually. This can involve feelings, actions, our identity, and include many different types of physical touch or stimulation. And intimacy is really the feeling of closeness and connectedness that we have in relationship. Um, and this can occur with or without a physical component um, of the relationship. And so, in our discussions, we're going to talk a lot about these two concepts. So, I just want to have some. Uh, definitions. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about sex in uh, the public media, online, and with that conversation, there's a lot of helpful things and also a lot of unhelpful things. Um, so I want to do a little bit of myth busting um, today, talking about sex in older adulthood. 
So the first myth is that older people aren't interested in sex and don't have much of it. And you probably know this already um, as evidence of you being at this talk, but this is completely incorrect. Um, though it is true that the uh, amount of people having sex declines with age, of those who do have sex um, in older adulthood, they have it with the same frequency of those of younger adults. Um, so if you are having sex as an older adult, it really um, is in the same amount as uh, younger people. The second myth is it isn't safe to have sex when you're older. Think of your heart. And I know we all have those um, stories in our mind of like the old man who dies while having sex. Um, but really we can think of sexual intercourse as moderate intensity exercise. So this is the same amount of exercise um, you have when you walk at a moderate pace for exercise. If you're biking, you know, on city streets for transportation, if you're doing manual labor, uh, like gardening or construction work, that is all within the bucket of moderate intensity exercise. And that is the same bucket that sex is in. Um, so if you're able to do um, those other types of exercise without impairment, likely sex um, is something that's safe for you. The last myth um, that I want to touch on is when you're older, you don't need to worry about safe sex. Um, so no one, no one has to worry about pregnancy. Um, but the reality is, among older adults, there are rising rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV among older adults. And we know from surveys um, within the US that there's a big lack of knowledge and education on safer sex practices among people who are 65 and older. Um, and so because of that, I want to just take some time and talk about safer sex practices. Um, so this is intended to be really practical knowledge that um, you can take with you into your, um, your life. So um, I tried to make it fun and have these colorful icons. And I just wanna go over the different tenets of safer sex. Um, the first one um, kind of evidenced by this uh, condom is barrier methods to prevent STIs. Um, so we traditionally think of barrier methods as external condoms. So these are condoms that are applied to the penis, um, but there are also internal condoms, which are condoms that can be placed within the vagina or within the anus. And these are um, barriers put in place to prevent the transmission of bodily fluids and blood during sexual activity. Alongside barrier methods, it's very important to use water-based lubricants. Um, lubricants are things that people of all ages use, and there are two pretty common subtypes. There's the water-based and oil-based. Um, and it's important to avoid the oil-based lubricants because they actually degrade the material of barriers, um, methods like condoms, and make them more prone to breaking, which increases your risk of transmitting a sexually transmitted infection. So very important, along with barrier methods, to use water-based lubricants. Um, the soap and, and the liquid um, soap refer to cleaning. And I'm not talking about cleaning your body, although that is something that uh, you should do regularly. I'm talking about cleaning any toys or devices used during sexual activity. Making sure uh, these devices and toys are cleaned and disinfected after every use helps prevent STI transmission. We talk about this a lot with you know, teenagers and young adults, college age students, but it's, in very, it's very important to avoid engaging in sexual activity under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, with younger people, we think about um, the risk-taking 
that happens when you're under the influence, uh, the inhibition that happens, and that same concept happens with older adults as well. Um, so when you're engaging in sexual activity, making sure you're, you're not under the influences of these substances. Next is STI testing. And so um, there are three big times when you should test for sexually transmitted infections. The first is when you change partners or have a new partner. The second is when you engage in high risk sexual activity. So for example, if you have multiple sexual partners um, at the same time, and then the third is if you are having any symptoms. So this can be pain, this can be discharge or skin lesions or rashes. All of these situations are situations that you should um, test for STIs. And the sexually transmitted infections that I'm talking about are, of course, chlamydia, gonorrhea, but also syphilis, trichomonas, and HIV. And then alongside testing is making sure we utilize the medications that we know can treat and also prevent STIs. So these are things like antibiotics for any STI that one might have, antivirals for people who have HSV or HIV, and also medications to prevent sexually transmitted infections. So that's something called PrEP which is a medication that's effective um, at preventing HIV. And so central to all of these safer sex practices is communication, open, direct, clear com communication with your sexual partners. Um, and that's not only you communicating your wants, your needs, um, the things that are important to you, but also being receptive to having that feedback from a partner. Next, I want to talk about common issues that can come up when engaging with your sexuality. And there's four dimensions, four flavors that I wanna talk about. The first are age-related changes. Um, so these are things that are more common as we get older. Um, for women after menopause, vaginal dryness is a huge issue. And this occurs because the lack of estrogen um, in our bodies can cause the vaginal and the vulvar tissue to atrophy and kind of shrink and tighten up. And alongside that, the lubricant that our body naturally makes um, decreases, causing dryness. And so the tighter uh, tissue, in addition to the less lubrication, can cause Pain during intercourse, it can lead to incontinence, and also frequent UTIs that can be a barrier to engaging sexually. And on the men's side, erectile dysfunction is more common as we age, and that's the inability to um, initiate or maintain an erection. Um, and that can be um, for a variety of different reasons one of which is underlying cardiovascular disease. So in the same way that your heart, the vessels in your heart can be clogged um, with atherosclerosis or um, cholesterol plaques, the same thing can happen to the blood vessels in your genital area. And that is one of many causes of erectile dysfunction. The second dimension is really specific health conditions. So arthritis, chronic pain can definitely be a barrier to engaging in sexual activity and engaging in the same way that you did when you were younger. Um, so some positions just may be more difficult to get into or difficult um, to maintain. Having strokes or other neurologic disorders for much of the same reason can also in, interfere with engaging sexually. Heart disease, um, like we talked about, uh, sexual activity can be thought of as exercise. And so if you have underlying heart disease, 
in the same way that walking um, around the block or climbing stairs may be difficult, sexual activity could also be difficult. Incontinence for both men and women can be really embarrassing and anxiety provoking and that is only magnified during sexual activity. So the fear of having an incontinent episode during sexual activity can really prevent a lot of people from engaging. And then prior surgeries, and in particular, I'm talking about um, surgeries to the genital tract or the urinary tract can also affect the anatomy um, and make sexual activity difficult. And um, prostatectomies are um, common uh, surgical procedures that can lead to sexual dysfunction, but also things like hysterectomies um, and other uh, genital or urinary surgeries can also um, cause sexual activity to be difficult. Next are medications. And I think um, this is the thing um, that is extremely common, um, common culprits of sexual dysfunction and things that are often overlooked. Um, blood pressure medications, things like beta blockers can lead to sexual dysfunction. Diuretics like thiazide diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide can also be a common culprit. Anticholinergic medications. And so these, this class of medications includes things like antihistamines, like over-the-counter allergy medications, um, some antidepressants can cause sexual side effects, um, things that you take for vertigo like meclizine or scopolamine patches can also have sexual side effects. And then outside of prescribed medications, there are also unprescribed substances that can inhibit sexual function like alcohol or drugs. And lastly, there are a lot of psychosocial issues that come up around sex. And this can be very clinical, like depression or anxiety. Um, decreased libido can be one of the symptoms of depression and anxiety, um, but also broader things like our past sexual experiences, um, loss of a partner, previous sexual trauma, um, our past enjoyable sexual experiences can also inform and cause anxieties and worries about our current sexual experiences. Um, so that is a huge component that we bring with us to our new partnerships or new sexual experiences as we age. Living situation can also impair engaging in one's um, sexuality. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about living with other people. Um, so a lot of older adults live with their children. Um, they can see uh, sexual activity in the context of living with one's children as awkward or even stigmatizing. Um, living in congregate care settings like nursing homes, assisted living facilities, can also make engaging in sexual activity difficult. Sometimes people can feel like they're being surveilled um, or they're being monitored or judged by the, the people that they're living with or the um, people who work at these um, congregate care settings. And on the part of the employees, um, sometimes employees can feel like it's their responsibility to restrict or enforce um, kind of safe practices and discourage people from engaging sexually. And then lastly, there are a lot of cultural expectations around sex, especially around sex in older adults. Um, in particular, LGBTQ older adults can find engaging in their sexuality very, very difficult. If someone has come out uh, later on in life, sometimes it's hard and very stigmatizing to engage in new sexual activities with new sexual partners that they previously um, have not engaged with. 
And sometimes people can feel like they're being closeted again, um, and that can be really distressing. In addition, um, especially for women, but for widowed people in general, um, the expectations around um, someone who has lost a partner engaging in sexual activity can also be very difficult to navigate. Um, and so all of these psychosocial issues contribute to awkward feelings or distress around engaging in sexual activity. And so what are the solutions? How can, how can we help? How can we kind of navigate this, this difficult space that we're in? Um, I wanna offer three suggestions to start building and improving our intimacy. So first, um, I encourage all of us to assess and explore our sexuality. Um, and this comes really in three broad questions. The first is, who are you? What is your gender identity? What's your sexual orientation? Do you have a partner? Do you want a partner? Is sex something that you value? These are all questions that we should ask ourselves. The second question is, what do you need? And there are many um, inventories and checklists that you can find online to really systematically go through your sexual health and well being and help you identify areas that you might want to focus on. Um, one of these uh, checklists is the brief sexual symptom checklist. Um, so you can Google that and find that online. And that's a very short checklist that you can run through on your own or with a partner to identify areas that you want to work on or focus on. Um, so who are you? What do you need? And are you satisfied? Sometimes older people, people in general, sex is not something that they want or desire, and that's totally okay. Um, for other people, it's very important and not having um, sexual activity um, can, can be distressing or saddening or contribute to their feelings of loneliness or isolation. And so really asking the question, as my life is right now, as my sexuality is right now, am I satisfied with that? And it's okay to say yes to that question. The second um, thing that we need to think about is expanding our ideas of intimacy beyond just sex. Sometimes, especially when you are having issues with sex, sex can feel like the whole piece of the pie when it comes to intimacy. Sex can feel like the end all be all. And if that isn't working, then the intimacy also isn't working. And so it's really important to think about sex in the context of other forms of intimacy. And so that what that looks like is cultivating both sexual and non-sexual relationships. Um, and then within your sexual relationship, thinking about ways to build intimacy. Um, so that can be um, sharing your experiences, sharing vulnerability in order to build a more trusting relationship. It can look like non-sexual touch, such as holding hands, um, hugging, just being close physically in proximity to one another. And it can look like other sexual acts that are not intercourse. Um, so that can be massages, that can be hugging or kissing, um, that can look in a variety of forms that don't necessarily involve sexual intercourse. So it's important to think about intimacy um, in a broader way and not always to prioritize sex. 
And then the third is talking to your healthcare provider. And we know based on um, surveys of older adults that very few older adults actually talk about sex and their sexual health to a doctor. And on the doctor's side, we know based on a lot of data that doctors also hold a lot of stigma and misconceptions when it comes to sexual health in older adults. So it's very, very important, although it's very, very challenging to have these discussions in a clinic visit. So I wanna talk about a couple of ways to broach this subject with your healthcare provider. So these are just a couple of suggested phrases that I think might be helpful to use in a clinic visit with your doctor. Um, and these phrases range from a very focused um, and direct question about a specific problem, such as the last one here. I have a new partner and I wanna get tested for SDI. Two more broader discussions of sexual health. Um, so making it known that this is something that's important to you by saying, my sexual relationship is something that's important. With this in mind, can we talk about how this care plan, how this treatment, how this medication will impact my sexual functioning? Like I said, Medications are often an overlooked but common culprit of sexual dysfunction. And so talking about that with a doctor, I'm having some issues with my intimacy that I worry are related to my medications. Can we review my medication list together? Um, and then I think it's always, always, always important to make time and space to have these conversations. Sometimes uh, the issue is very clear. Other times the issue is very nuanced and complex. So it's always okay to ask your doctor to have a dedicated visit to talk about your sexual health. So you can say, you know, I was really hoping to talk about my sexual health today, but we ran out of time. Can we schedule another visit to talk specifically about this in detail? And so these are just some suggested phrases that you can use um, in the clinic with your healthcare provider to open up the conversation about sex and intimacy. And so in response to broaching that subject, there are a variety of things that a doctor can suggest to help improve your sexual well-being. So the first is working up under lying health conditions. Like I said, um, sometimes sexual dysfunction can be a symptom of a health condition. Um, so in addition to sexual dysfunction, lack of libido being a symptom of depression or anxiety, um, things like erectile dysfunction can be a symptom of cardiovascular disease. So working up any underlying health conditions can look like doing a stress test um, or reviewing medication. See if there's some underlying cause of your sexual dysfunction. Second, doctors or other healthcare providers can prescribe or suggest treatments to improve your sexual functioning. So this could be topical or systemic hormones like topical vaginal estrogen for vaginal dryness. It can be things to treat erectile dysfunction like sildenafil or tadalafil, which are Viagra or Cialis. They can be recommending devices like um, vibrators or vacuum erection devices or things like physical therapy. So pelvic floor therapy to help with um, pain during sex, or incontinence. It could also be things like cardiac rehab to get your exercise tolerance up. And then lastly, they could suggest behavioral health interventions, individual therapy, couples therapy, 
um, participation in supportive communities of people who have the same health conditions, are going through the same life experiences. Both of those things can be really, really helpful for people um, working out their issues as it relates to their sexuality. And then um, lastly, there are also sexual therapists, people who are trained and licensed um, to help people work through their issues as it relates to their sexual function that could also be recommended. And underlying all of this, doctors can be really helpful when you have that open communication to steering you away from treatments or medications that uh, don't work, that are costly, or that are potentially harmful. Um, so these are some of the ways that doctors and other healthcare providers can help you navigate your sexuality. Um, and I just wanna to touch on some resources and other interesting reads. Um, so the New York Times actually has a lot of really good articles talking about sex and intimacy in older adulthood. Um, and so I definitely encourage you to read some of these articles. They're very interesting and, and really well-written. In addition, um, on Senior Planet, org, um, the URL is, is on the slide. They have a whole web page dedicated to sex and relationships. Um, and there's actually a really nice um, sex column called Ask Joan, um, where people submit questions. And she has a really thoughtful discussion about things that can be helpful um, uh, for, for sex and, and intimacy issues. Um, and so with that, there's three main takeaways that um, I want you to come away from this talk with. One, sexuality and intimacy are important aspects of life, including in the lives of older adults. Safer sex practices should be used at, at all ages whenever you're engaging in sexual activity. And then it's really, really important to take an inventory of your own sexual well-being and to feel empowered to bring this discussion into your clinic visit. Um, so with that, thanks so much for listening and I will um, open it up this time for any questions or thoughts or discussions that folks would like to share. Thank you, Dr. Connor. That was very, very informative and helpful. Um, there is one question, but I'm not sure if I entirely understand it, um, but it's, it's in the chat. And the question is, I just have to scroll up. What is your response um, with respect to women minorities in the South with regard to intimacy? And I don't know if the person who submitted that maybe wants to add a little more detail, um, because I'm not entirely sure. Um, what the question is. But Dr. Connor, if you have any thoughts, jump in. Yeah, um, I, I'll just share a couple of my thoughts. I think um, sometimes for some people, um, sexuality and expressing one's sexuality can be uh, policed in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think maybe that's what this question is getting at. Um, so in particular, Southern culture, as someone from Texas, I can attest, um, there isn't a lot of conversation about sex and sexuality. Um, and for Black women in particular, um, their uh, sexuality is often um, seen as negative. Um, their bodies are seen as things that are dangerous. Um, or overly sexualized. And I think that also causes a lot of stigma um, in, in Black communities and Black women communities about talking openly about their sexuality or difficulties that they're having with their sexuality. Um, so I think that might be um, what this question is getting at. And I think um, partly there's culture change that needs to be made. Um, and with that, coming more open conversations about um, what people are going through, 
how people present themselves and the difficulties that they might be having. And um, on, on the part of the individual feeling empowered to start these conversations with a healthcare provider. Um, but I know it's, it's difficult, um, especially when you have external forces um, kind of telling you or signaling to you that um, your sexuality or how you present yourself is, is, um, is bad or wrong. Um, but I, I think in addition to the larger culture change that we have to do as a society, um, there's also kind of individual work that you can do with a doctor to make sure that uh, your sexuality and your sexual life um, is fulfilling to you. Thank you. That, thank you for that very thoughtful response. Um, I want to make sure we give Dr. Russell time to talk with us today, but there is a question that you add the assessment tool name that you mentioned again, and you could you could put that in the chat. That might be really helpful. So Dr. Russell, I'm going to turn this over to you for your update. Great. And thank you so much, Dr. Connor. This was just an outstanding talk. Um, it never goes away. We always, you know, we're sexual beings and it's great to normalize that. And um, one thing that I hope we'll be talking about next month um, as well will be, you know, the body, the body changes we, uh, we, we, we experience as we get older can sometimes make us feel, I don't know, less, less likely to engage. But body positivity is also an important part of this process and recognizing that, you know, every, every body uh, it, it is beautiful. And so it's, um, I'm just so excited we're, we're, we're airing this, this conversation. So thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to uh, give you some updates um, on the goings on in our clinic. I can speak briefly to uh, COVID issues. Right now it's sort of not in a spike. The big spike was at the start of the new year and it was nowhere near as a big a spike as it was last new year. And um, by now, everyone should have received their four, so their 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 two, two and two series, and now the fifth bivalent booster. Um, and I don't know of any recommendations just on mass for uh, older adults to get uh, additional vaccinations beyond those five. Um, and if there there if there are those considerations, usually that's in more immunosuppressed populations. Um, we have two new uh, clinical programs happening in our geriatrics practice that you or a friend might be uh, interested in, in hearing about. One is our cognitive health clinic, um, and that's run by uh, Barbara Moskowitz from the Dementia Caregiver Support Group and uh, Dr. Catherine Hanley. She's one of our geriatricians. So that's where folks who have cognitive concerns can go, be evaluated, and it's really an interprofessional way of looking at keeping people independent and functioning in the community. The second clinic that we have uh, now is called the Age Positively Clinic. So this is a collaboration between the infectious disease, HIV doctors, and geriatrics. People who have HIV can experience geriatrics syndromes like frailty and falls and polypharmacy, but being on a lot of medicines um, much earlier than the general population. Um, they can also experience, I, I love that Jade mentioned this, um, marginalization because of their, of their status and an unwillingness to engage in healthcare um, outside of their HIV doctor for fear of, of judgment. Um, so this is really a, a, a delightful collaboration between the two divisions, and um, we're very eager to uh, to fill those fill those slots with with patients. Um, I'd also like to name if there's a movie that you'd like to see that speaks about the experience of older LGBTQ folks. There's a movie from about 12 years ago called Generation Silent. And it, it speaks exactly to what it's like for older uh, LGBTQ adults as they start to encounter the healthcare system. Um, and the stories are very eye-opening and we have our medical students will watch it uh, because it, it's, it's, it's very much uh, about how you define yourself and your home and what it means to have people coming into your home um, 
not sitting in judgment of you, but really uh, being appropriately attuned to your cultural outlooks. Um, and I think those are the two main clinic, uh, clinic innovations that I wanted to speak about. So with that, let's get to the, the, the Q&A. I would love that. Yes, there, thank you. Um, there is a question about um, how do we, um, what are the resources for dating um, when you're older? And I don't know who I should direct this to, but I'm going to just open this up to Dr. Levine, Dr. Connor, or Dr. Russell. Um, but what are some of the resources that people may access about dating opportunities? Yeah, I answered this um, a little bit in the chat, um, but I can expand a little bit of my thinking. But I think, uh, Joanne, your question is like very, very spot on. Um, especially in the era of COVID, a lot of the dating scene has shifted to online or on social media apps. Um, and those apps can be very inaccessible um, for older adults and also um, have like a smaller number of older adults on them, which can make um, using social media apps uh, difficult to find dating um, or potential partners. Um, there are a couple of web websites and apps um, that uh, have like a higher concentration of older adults and are also like more easy to use and easy to navigate. eHarmony is a good one. Um, there's another dating site called Our Time um, that is specifically um, geared to towards older adults. Um, and then in addition, I think kind of like tried and true in-person things, especially as uh, things have gotten more safe. Um, it, it, that's also very good to meet people. So social groups, traveling groups, um, meeting people who are interested um, in you know, a more public social setting and things that you're also interested in um, is another good way to, um, to find potential partners. I would just like to add that half of the reason we go on dates is to tell our friends the stories of how disastrous they were. <laughs> so, so we can, you have to kiss a lot of frogs in this life. Um, and, you know, things, things like uh, book clubs and, um, and paint nights or, or community activities, sometimes people will socialize through church. I mean, it can be, comp, you know, especially at this stage of our lives when we're really looking for people sharing common interests and at my speed, what I'm interested in, these are great opportunities. Um, I just wanna highlight that Jade brought up the, sorry, Dr. Connor brought, brought up the um, Senior Planet. Many of you have heard us talk about seniorplanet.org for exercise. Now I know there's a sex blog. This is phenom This is a phenomenal website and, and has, it, I just saw there's a tab for a book club. Um, and uh, this is an organization that grew out of work done at Cornell, and they really are filling this niche during COVID times. And so I strongly encourage you to take a tool around the Senior Planet website. Dr. Levine, do you want to add anything? Well, I actually have several patients who just love going on a cruise. You're trapped with a whole bunch of people for better or for worse, um, but you might find the better there. And um, I guess it depends how big the ship is, um, but <laughs> there it seems to be, and it, you have to have the resources to do things like this. But there's a lot of there's a lot of intellectual stimulation as well as possible sexual stimulation <laughs> when you go on a cruise. Um, and there, uh, I mean, I think that. There are a lot of um, patients, that, you know, that I have uh, who are older adults that really love this as a social interaction and a way of meeting new people and um, having new experiences and learning new things at the same time. In addition to all of the the websites that um, Dr. Connor was talking about and and the Senior Planet stuff, I think it's always good to to talk in groups. I think people feel very alone sometimes in our patient population. 
And you'd be surprised how many people, I mean, I hear the same story from many different people about different things. There's a certain familiar ring to, um, to, to, to being at this stage of life. And um, it's wonderful to be able to have people that you meet to make new friends, you know, when you are in your 80s and 90s. And that, that is, a, that is a, a, a gift. I mean, if you have the health to do that, but you know, we having talk groups is just as good. And to be able to share in that way is, is a social activity. There are, you know, meal sites and lunch sites. There's um, ones that are for the LGBTQ community here also um, that are wonderful. And I really want to echo Matt's um, Jen Silent, that movie. It's a little, but there are parts of it that are very hard to watch, um, but it is very much makes you feel a, the vibrancy of a community that really is, um, it, it, it really has found itself um, in order to get over very hard times. And it's a very beautiful movie. There is a LGBTQ and aging um, group in um, organization in Boston, and um, it's it, it it does all kinds of wonderful work. So I think um, it's not just going on a cruise, but it's just being with other people sometimes. And and then the other thing that I would just say is talk to your doctor, you know. And if you have a doctor, a doctor who clears his or her throat a lot and is, feels like they're choking on a bone when they try and answer your questions, um, then you got to find somebody else to talk to about this. But I think I mean I really appreciate it when people ask me about this, and sometimes I can answer their questions. And sometimes I can't, especially around things like medications or um, medical, the, the kinds of medical problems around vaginal dryness and, the, you know, things that occur in aging. I think maybe I'll tell my, I think I'll tell you my, my one wonderful story. Many of you may have heard it. Um, I had a, I have a friend who was an ophthalmologist and she went to see her ophthalmologist and the uh, uh, ophthalmologist said to her, um, do you have dry eyes? And she, cause she was said her eyes were burning and she said, honey, at my age, everything is dry. <laughs> and that is the dirty truth. Um, we do get a little, you know, he were talking about lubricants. I mean, we do get, we change, we change as we age, but I have to say it's good to age because it gives you a lot of perspective um, it gives you a lot of wisdom. It gives you a lot of experience to rely on about yourself and what you like and what you don't like in people or in sex and intimacy or in, you know, what makes you happy when you watch Netflix. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I feel that, you know, older adults often don't suffer fools gladly if they can get over their fears about talking about some things. So I, I think. It's one of the reasons I love being a geriatrician hmm. for the stories that you have to tell us and also for the things that I learn from from the, the people that I interact with, um, either through stories in our practice or stories in our, you know, in our encounters. So I, I do think, um, you know, this can be a very rich time of life, even though it's filled with many different kinds of losses in your physical function or your mental function or your relationships, there's always ways to make new people, have bring new people into your life. And um, older adults are more resilient than I ever thought that they would be. There's a tremendous amount of resilience. Um, and don't forget church, synagogue, all of those things, which often are real magnets for people who, um, you know, are otherwise, otherwise um, unbefriended in, in everyday life. And I think that that is, th these are important not only organizations, but, you know, re religious organizations too, to meet new friends. Late and singing life. groups and community theater. Yes, true. Anywhere there's food. Well, there's one, there are a couple of other resources that we've actually shared in our town halls that I just want to remind people about. And one is the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, where you can take online and in-person courses. And because, um, because Dr. Levine brought up cruises, I also want to remind people about a wonderful travel organization called Road Scholar. It's R-O-A-D. 
and they have more trips than you could possibly imagine. And they're extremely well organized, thoughtful, and they're very reasonably priced. Um, and the trips are basically for people over 55, but most of the people that do road scholar trips are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and they're quite wonderful. And um, they give you enough information to prepare you for these trips that you've got a PhD in whatever you're about to visit. So um, I would encourage you to maybe check some of those out as well. So we are almost at the end of our time. I don't think we have any new questions, but I really want to thank Dr. Connor and Dr. Levine and Dr. Russell. Um, we are going to continue to explore this subject in slightly different ways at our next town hall, which will be on March 30th. So you'll be getting um, an invitation to attend that. We encourage you to join us and um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I, I, I'm not in Boston actually today, but I hear it's quite beautiful and it's snowing. So it is. Um, Susan, do you have the title of the part two map? Do we have the title yeah, of part, part two? two is closeness and intimacy as we age, part two. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.